a Living History production. I'm Peter Hart. And I'm Gary Bain. And together we're Pete and Gary's Military History Podcast. Hello and welcome to the podcast. And what we got for him today, Gary? What we got? What we got? Well, today, Pete, we're uh, we're going back to Jutland, and we're going to we're going to concentrate on HMS Warspite, Pete. HMS Warspite. Now, there's a fine old name. Fine old name. You, you had a better name. Ship. You had a better name for it, didn't you? HMS Spite War. Yes. You'd have liked to have called it that, wouldn't you? Yes, HMS Pete. Spite War. One of the spiteful class. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Your spite. Right. So, uh, what is uh, HMS Warspite? What is HMS Warspite? Well, she, the, the, she's about, there's been several more Warspites before her. But this one is one of the Queen Elizabeth class. Uh, was that named after Queen Elizabeth II or Queen Elizabeth I? Queen a Elizabeth II Queen Elizabeth II hadn't been born. You have passed the test with flying colours. Uh, and what, the Queen Elizabeth class, they were the first super dreadnoughts. Uh, they're, they're the next stage in a sort of revolution, the battleship revolution, after the dreadnought of 1906. Now, um, the dreadnought had had uh, 10, 12-inch guns, but what has this one got? Why is this one so much better, Gary? Well, she's armed with eight, count them, eight mighty 15-inch guns that could project a huge 1,950-pound shell up to 35,000 yards. How many miles is that? (laughs) 35,000 yards. Now, she's also well protected, Pete. She's got uh, armour which is up to 13-inch thick over her vitals. (laughs) She's powered by huge oil-fired turbine engines that could drive them along at some 24 knots. Now, hang on a minute. The, the 24 knots, Pete. What, what's that interrelation, for example, with a cruiser? What would a, what would a cruiser... They'd be, they'd be faster. For the battle cruisers, for instance, the early ones, the Invincible class, yeah. the, were the first ones, were about 26 knots. But not a lot, and the though. later battle... The, the later ones were 28 knots. So it's not that far distant. And remember, ships don't always rattle along at top speed. So she could, they could make almost the speed of the battlecruisers. That's going to be a key point. And it depends what, what th- how big a knot you tie, doesn't it? It does. You've got to tie a knot in it or it'll fall off. Um, the, 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 the point about these things, the, these super dreadnoughts, is, is that they, in a sense they make battlecruisers outmoded because... They are the perfect ship. They, they've got it all. They've got they've got the the, the punch, the he, the heavy hitting with the fifteen inch guns. They've got the armor protection, and they've got speed. There's no longer a need with like the battle cruisers where you compromise protection uh, uh, to get speed. Uh, that was the old problem, uh, uh, as Fisher used to say. Often he used to say when he was down the pub, he used to say, "Ah, speed will be their armor." He used to say in the pub, and people would go. That's bollocks. Who was right? Uh, the people who said that's bollocks. <laughs> now, given the speed, BT, that's uh, Admiral BT, I presume. Admiral Sir David. Yeah, of, of the uniforms. He had long coveted these uh, magnificent ships as an addition to the battlecruiser fleet. And he, he was initially thwarted, wasn't he, by Jellico? They pointed out that although the Super Dreadnoughts were fast, they were still not as fast as the battle cruisers. Nah, but BT, he's, he's not the man to be deterred by logic or common sense or anything like that. And he continues to press his case. And he promises, promises, Gary, that whatever will happen, he, he'll, keep the, he'll keep them close by. That even after a long chase, he would have them within five miles of, 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 of the main battle cruiser fleet. Uh, and uh, Jellico, though, what do you think Jellico's fears are, given BT's character? Well, I should imagine that he's he's a bit concerned that he might overreach himself and take on the high seas fleet all on his own, um, especially if he's got such a strong support supporting squadron. That's it. And if you think about it, um, there's nothing more attractive for Admiral Reinhard Scheer commanding the uh, the high seas fleet. Nothing that he'd like more than to cut off, trap, and destroy the fifth battle squadron. Uh, however, however. 
Uh, various incidents, things, Battle of Dogger Bank, other other uh, things, had shown that the battle cruiser fleet's gunnery wasn't very good. Now they weren't allowed to practice their gunnery in the Firth of Forth. Why do you think that was, Gary? Well, in case they hit something. <laughs> well, they're trying to hit something. <laughs> yeah, but what, I meant the wrong something. <laughs> well, that's a possibility. Also, the noise might upset the good people of Edinburgh. Now, you and I would both welcome such a thing <laughs> who cares about the people of edinburgh is our motto and watchword but uh, and i'm sure they'll remind me of that next time i'm there but uh, um uh, the, the result was that what they do is squadron by squadron they'd send ba- beatty's battle cruisers to uh scapa flow where they could have intensive gunnery practice and so when he sent the third battle cruiser squadron off the uh the fifth battle squadron is the that's the super dreadnoughts it's the only real option to replace them so I like to picture Jellico sitting there, grinding his teeth and, well, gritting, grinding, and and eventually he sends them down to join Beatty at Rosyth, which is where the battlecruiser fleet is, which is just past the big bridgey thing on the 22nd of May 1916. Now, who are they under the command? Who is commanding them? Uh, well, at that um, point, they're under the command of Vice Admiral Sir Hugh Evan Thomas, Pete. Oh, he's lovely. He is. He's on. He's on HMS Barham. And uh, now, well, one thing is, before their people write in and say Pete can't pronounce Barham, because the real naval officers pronounce it in some ludicrous fashion as Barham, 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 Barham. But I don't. I say Barham, not Barham. Occasionally, I say that as well. <laughs> I know I don't say it right, but Sodom. Now, uh, so so what, what what are the ships in the fifth battle squadron? Let's go through them. Uh, I presume the Queen Elizabeth is with them, of course. No, no. And I mean, Queen Elizabeth was booked in for a refit at the Recife dockyard, but her sister ships was was Queen Elizabeth having a bot- bottom <laughs> scraped? <laughs> yes, Pete. She's having the barnacles removed from her bottom. That's- um, but her sister ships, as you mentioned, the Barham, the Malaya, the Valiant and the Warspite were all at Beatty's disposal until the third battle cruiser squadron returned. And Warspite, who we're particularly interested in today... We Pete, are interested in her, aren't we? Uh, ...was commanded by Captain Edward Philpotts. Lovely bloke. I think Good old fashioned at the war Spain. Museum. Now... Yeah. Um, we're not going to tell the story of the Battle of Jutland, are we? But it, it, you, because we did this in a podcast last year, this time and last year. also, we don't know it. No, you don't know it. I'm supposed to know it. Remember, oh, yeah. I wrote that book. Oh, yeah, book, you wrote Jutland. that book about it. Jutland, it was called, with Nigel Steele. He's lovely. Just that, off Nigel the Steele. coast of Clacton. Just, well, just off Southwold, I always say. Now, um, so the intelligence had been passed to Reinhard, uh, that Reinhard Scheer was out in the North Sea. That was some various signals, interception, and the rest of it. Uh, and the battle cruiser's is fleet is sent out from Rosyth, and it, uh, uh, while the Grand Fleet is coming out from Scapa. Now, it's a, it's a real image of silent power. And my, my first quote is from seaman torpedo man Harry Haley, Haler. Of HMS, they're all HMS Warspite. And I've specifically selected this so that you'd have to read it. <laughs> You're doing it today, Pete. Uh, yes. Fortunately, I forgot that you assigned them. And uh, here it goes. Imagine, darling, if you can. Darling? <laughs> oh, Pete, a fi- sweetheart. I find, I find those starless night and 12 great ships steaming out of the fourth. No lights visible and not a sound to be heard but the swish of the waves. And uh, the huge, I, 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 when I go, when I'm there uh, and I go across on the train across the, across the bridge, I can almost imagine the scene, the, the raising anchor, they manoeuvre around, form into line, one by one they pass under the, the mighty well, fourth bridge. When we, uh, when we did the podcast on the Falklands and the Coronel, uh, we, we watched a film, didn't we, Peter? A uh, DVD yeah. film. And uh, I would heartily recommend people to watch that because it does show you the power and the majesty. And I think, actually, Barham is one of the ships in in it. I think it's pretending to be one of the German ships, I think. Yes, that's right. That is um, right. It it really is worth watching, Pete, because you get that that image of majesty and power. um, And I would heartily recommend it. 
So anyway, this is a quote about going under the fourth bridge from midshipman Richard Fairthorne, uh, the war spy. Now, I should do this in a squeaky voice, but I'm told by people who are not necessarily my friends that my voice is squeaky enough, so I'll just do it in my normal voice. At high water, we actually cleared the bridge by some 12 feet, but on approaching the bridge, it, it almost appeared, right up to the last moment, almost, that we must inevitably hit it. Hardened seafarers on the upper deck <laughs> have been seen started to turn up their collar or even disappear under cover in order to d dodge the falling topmast. Then, at the very last moment, the top match seemed to oblige by dipping clear. Looking ast astern, it then suddenly reappeared as high as before. This phenomenon never ceased to fascinate me. There you go. And that, it's a, it's it, because <clears throat> they are big, tall ships. It, they just thought they were going to hit into the, the, the bridge. Um, as far as the lower deck is concerned, this is just one more sweep into the North Sea. Just part of an almost endless routine, isn't it? And there's nothing really to indicate otherwise. So they're out in the sea by 1330, or 31st of May, 1916. BT has his force. The second battlecruiser squadron uh, is two miles to the northeast of the first battlecruiser squadron. Um, now, remember that he promised to have the 5th Battery Squadron no further than five miles, even after a stern chase. How far away was the 5th Battle Squadron from him? Well, actually, he's, he's good to his word at this point because they are some five miles to the north northwest of ah, the no, line. Ah, no, Gary, but, but have they just been on a stern chase? No, from, no, no, uh, but that's, well, that's what I'm saying at this <laughs> point. They are five miles to the north northwest of the Lion. Um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to make a point here that Beatty promised it would be five miles after a stern chase. Oh, I see what you mean. Chase. Yes, yes. It, so, yeah, it does. It does rather make a mockery of his that, promise, I suppose. Yes, it's it, uh, it, it is. It's just they're meant to be closer than that, and that was the, the maximum uh, uh, within a mile or so. Like, oh. like the other ones, sir. Now, 3058, they're, they're getting near the designated point, uh, res rendezvous point, uh, 3058. And BT shift signals his sh ships. Now, this might be a bit technical for you. Uh, Leslie Phillips used to say, left hand down a bit. <laughs> uh, so they're, uh, they're ready. Is that what yeah, you're telling me? Turning to the left. Uh, at 1415 to the northeast to move towards a junction with the Grand Fleet, which is sailing down from the north. If you don't understand this, we'll put maps up, but uh, if we remember, and Gary often forgets. Um, now, the ba German battlecruiser squadron, they're out and they're in front of the high seas fleet and they're going north some 50 miles to the east of Beatty. Now at first they're too far apart to see each other and even their light cruiser screens are still 16 miles apart. Uh, but what happens next is that when the screens do touch there's enormous confusion and the fifth but the signal confusion so bt signals are not followed. He signals by flags they're not seen and the fifth battle squadron turns but the battle cruisers go off to the south. So what's happening is the distance, five miles. So now it's is, getting bigger. So they're going left yeah. and they've gone right. So your five is, miles it, is going to be 10 miles pretty quickly. Very quickly, that's right. And and, uh, and, B, and that means that Beatty's battle cruisers are on their own. Now there's, there's, there's one more of them than the Germans, but it's not good. Now, um, the, on the war spite, they know now that there's going to be an action and and one of the heroes of our tale today has has to uh, get the ship ready now the, this person is commander humphrey walwin uh, and he's executive commander aboard the uh, the, the war spy and he's in charge of the uh, in the sense of the ship and the state of the ship and and the, the damage control parties just about everything with uh, with with the ship uh, now you you're going to do uh, walwin humphrey walwin and you've got the first uh, quote here coming there's a lot there's going to be a lot for from him passed the word round to everybody that we were in for the real thing and went all round mess decks wetted decks put all table and stools on the deck and lit all action candles etc etc saw all doors and everything closed and went up on deck they were just finishing washing down the weather decks and i sent all hands to their stations and went up and reported everything was ready now the next quote in a ship it's quite weird because people there's a lot of people have no idea what's happening and right down in the depths of the ship is the transmitting sh station now that's where able seaman harry Haler was he is a very affectionate man and he says this and uh, gary i want you to feel this imagine imagine my dearest are you imagining 
a room 18 feet square, in the centre of which is a roll of paper. This is stretched across the table to another roller, which is being revolved by a motor, and so keeps the paper constantly on the move. On this is plotted out or plotted out all the information which men at the guns want to know. All round the walls of the transmitting station are the different electrical instruments for sending the information up to the guns, beside voice pipes and telephones. In all there are about 20 men in this room and each one has so many of these instruments to attend. The first order which comes from the control officer is to inform all guns to load with lyddite shell and the battle commences. Now uh, the battle started between the battle cruisers, so the 5th Battle Squadron is miles behind and they're desperately trying to catch up. They're, turning, they're cutting corners, trying to, you know, where they're, they're desperately trying to catch up. Uh, and uh, they, they, they can't catch the German battle cruisers up because they've turned back towards the high seas fleet. They're heading south as well. Everybody's heading south at this stage. It's called uh, the, the, move the, the run something. to the south, isn't it? That's right. You've remembered it. I was just seeing if you remembered. I couldn't. Um, and uh, they, 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 they start to fire at the German second scouting group. Now, this is the, uh, the German light cruiser. It's the German uh, screen, uh, destroyer and cruiser screen. Now, uh, Humphrey Walwyn's, he's, uh, his duty station's at B's turret of the war spot. I think that's the, of the front, there's four turrets, two at the front, two at the back, and at B one is the second one back, I think. Uh, and this is what he says. Got orders to load and train Red 20. Could not see anything at all. Hazy and a lot of smoke about. We were now steering very hard. Wondered if our steering jack staff would be shot away as we had just fitted a new one. Everybody in the turret in very good spirits and I asked Grenfell if he had any cotton wool. He said he hadn't and passed me a lump of cotton waste enough to stop the ears of a donkey which I chucked back at him. Why has he got a donkey there? <laughs> well, you are aware of the reputation of the Royal Navy. <laughs> yeah. I think that's why you wanted to join them, wasn't it? Yes, it was the donkeys. <laughs> it was the donkeys. Every turret has his donkey for those off-duty off moments. Um, now, it's about 1605 that the 5th Battle Squadron finally sights the German battle cruisers. Uh, it's caught them up enough cut enough corners, and they open fire at extreme range. Now, amongst them is Sub-Lieutenant Eric Brand. Now, he is a, he's at his station. He's a rate officer operating a Dummeresque instrument in the 15-inch gun control tower aboard the Valiant. No, he's not. <laughs> it's, it, uh, well, I've got confused here. He, he's on the uh, war spite, I think. I've What's a Dummeresque really instrument? Uh, it's a complicated instrument for taking uh, the. It, it converts it, what it sees into um, into things that sight the guns. I've no idea. Thanks, in mate. fact, the, I got it wrong in the book at first. <laughs> and some bloke sent me a thing. That's not how it works. And sent me a thing. And do you know what I remember of it? Nothing. You know, I, um, I'm I'm fully up to speed on that now. Thanks, mate. Anyway, this is what Eric Brand says. When rather idly searching the horizon with my glasses out of the port slit of the tower, I saw a German ship and exclaimed, My God, it's the Von der Tan! And getting busy, estimating her inclination and speed. As soon as we could, we opened fire at a range of 22,000 yards. Oh, or at any rate, the time of flight was around 45 seconds. In those days, we only fired one four-gun salvo and waited to see the splash before making any correction to the range of firing the next salvo. So that's the first shots are being fired. Now, this is a serious matter, the fire of these super dreadnoughts for the poor old von der Tan, uh, that's at the back of the German line, and the Moltke, which is the second from the back. Uh, that's all they can reach at the moment. Because they are not built to cope with 15-inch shells. They're really not. And the heavy British shells takes a visible toll because the 15-inch the guns, and I, I, God knows why, it's, a, it's probably the most accurate gun the British ever made. It's far more accurate than the 12-inch, it, and it's a bit more accurate than the 13.5 inch it's very accurate and this is uh, this is our chum Humphrey Walwyn again commander Humphrey Walwyn what does he say he says they straddled us once or twice but we had not been hit at all so far I think they were zigzagging very much as their deflection was very hard to pick up I distinctly saw one salvo hit number five now that's the von uh, de Tan von, it was fifth in yeah. the line and she turned away about six points to port and went away in a cloud of black and white smoke. 
Now, unfortunately, before the battle cruisers, the fifth, the, ba the the battleships, as we might call them, the super dreadnoughts had taken part. The battle cruisers had already lost the indefatigable and the Queen Mary before they really bring relief. Uh, and uh, and then the next stage of the battle is that. Uh, Beatty's cruisers send a warning back that they're about to run it straight into the high seas fleet. So Beatty turns and heads back towards the gra his support, the Grand Fleet, which is rushing down from the north. And this is called, what's this called, Gary? The Run to the North. That's right. Brilliant. And, uh, and, the, and guess what? Guess, guess what? Guess what? Guess what happens this time? There's another signalling cock-up. We're not going to go into it, but it's just a serious cock-up, and they don't give the orders properly. So the 5th Battle Squadron, which... And, and I've got to say that Evan Thomas doesn't seem to have had a lot of initiative, uh, carries on sailing straight towards the High Seas Fleet. And Co Commander Humphrey Walwyn says this. I suddenly saw our battle cruisers coming close by about four cables in the opposite direction, and I realised they had turned back. I saw Queen Mary and Indefatigable, Indefatigable were adrift, but never for a moment realised they had gone. Before this, we had passed through a mass of black water with an M-class picking up people. That's I, a destroyer. I heard afterwards this was the Queen Mary. X-turret of Lyon was trained towards us, guns at full elevation, several hits showing on her port side, great black splashes. Now, the 5th Battle Squadron, so, so you, they see them coming back and they carry on for another five minutes, four or five minutes. And then, when they are ordered, they turn in succession. Instead of all turning at once, they turn one by one on the same spot, uh, under heavy fire. Uh, but this is the point. Unlike the battle cruisers, they've got heavy armour protection. This is what Humphrey Walwyn says now. Very soon after the turn, I suddenly saw on the starboard quarter the whole of the high seas fleet. At least I saw masts, funnels, and an endless ripple of orange flashes all down the line. How many I didn't try and count, as we were getting well strafed at this time. Now, they're, they're, they're acting as a rear guard, aren't they? That's what they're doing. Uh, the battle cruisers are streaking off, and they're acting as a rear, graph, a rear guard. Now, the, the, everybody's now turned. Uh, the, the German battle cruisers are, are in front of the German high seas fleet. The battle cruisers are, are off, and uh, behind them comes the 5th Battle Squadron. The Barham and the Valiant are targeting the German battle cruisers. The Warspite and the Malaya are aiming at the leading German battleships of the high seas fleet. Now, they are getting hit, and at 1714... The warship has a, a shell that crashes into the base of the after funnel. And this is Surgeon Gordon Ellis of Warspite. She says this. He says this, not she. We got our first hit. It seemed to be on the ar armour abreast of our station, on the waterline from the closest of the sound. But actually it was some way further aft, I believe. One could hear the distinct sound of metal striking against metal. And it was quite different to any of the subsequent hits we received, as if it had struck... Broadway's on without exploding. That's weird. Now, they're exchanging hammer blows, aren't they, at this time? And this is what uh, Humphrey Walwyn says. I mean, of course, this man is the, the man who's responsible for keeping the war spike going. And this is what he says. The noise of their shells over and short was deafening. That frightful crack, crack, crack going all the time. Felt one or two very heavy shakes, but didn't think very much of it at the time. And it never occurred to me that we were being hit. We were firing pretty fast. I distinctly saw two of our salvos hit the leading German battleship. Sheets of yellow flame went right over her mastheads, and she looked red fore and aft like a burning haystack. I know we hit her hard. They, they bloody well did. The, the front German battleships got a hell of a pounding. Now, at about 1730, the war spikes hit by a salvo of shells, and that comes down on the quarter deck uh, and around X turret. That uh, X and Y turret are the, are the back two. And the quarter decks that the, the you could put your drawing up, Peter, and, and that that would show it. Oh, the draw my drawing of HMS Warspite in yeah. in Delville Wood. Yeah, yeah, that'll help them. Yeah, and this is Assistant Clerk uh, Gilbert Bickmore of the Warspite. He says this: the Warspite received one hit from an eleven-inch shell, which hit right aft, even in a turret at the other end of the ship. We felt the hit, which made the ship give a sort of wriggle, <laughs> very like the feel of a trout on the end of a line. 
Now, what, uh, Commander Walwyn, he's told by the captain, uh, Phil Potts, to go aft and see what's happening on the quarter deck and, and around Exeter. And this is what uh, Walwyn uh, thinks. And I like, I like, this is a senior British naval officer of the Royal Navy, uh, and I like the note of caution he has. <laughs> I thought for a few seconds, should I go over the top of the turret or down through the shell room? but realised I ought to get there quickly and decided to go over the top. I didn't waste much time on the roof as the noise was awful and they were coming over pretty quick. As I got down the starboard ladder of B turret, both A and B fired and made me skip a bit quicker. Ran How down, it did. <laughs> did. Ran down ladder and tried to get into the port superstructure. All clips were on, so I climbed over second cutter. Just as I got up, one came through the after tunnel with an, sorry, after funnel, with an awful screech and splattered about everywhere. I put my coat collar and run like a stag. He put up his coat collar, and I can imagine he put up his coat, co coat collar <laughs> as a protection. I'm not sure that a coat collar would be much protection against bits of a bloody great big 11-inch uh, uh, shell. Would, uh, what do you think? I think it's all right. I think it's 15-inch shells it struggles with. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I yes. put up my coat collar and ran like a stag, feeling in a hell of a funk. We've had that bit. No, didn't do that bit. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, now, uh, he, uh, he, can't, he can't find anything wrong, and he's searching through the mess decks, and then he actually sees a, a shell hit, doesn't he? He does, and he says this. Went through the fossil mess deck. Foxel. Foxel. I'm not in the Navy. Went through the Foxel mess deck, and was just going forward when a 12-inch came through the side armour on the boys' mess deck. Terrific sheet of golden flame, stink, impenetrable dust, and everything seemed to fall everywhere with an appalling noise. Do you think his coat would have been... We've discussed that no good against 15-inch, but of course he wouldn't get that. What about 12-inch? Would, would it be... Because the German shells are 11 and 12-inch. Well, I think, he's, I think he's got further quotes, so I think it, it stood up to it. All right, yeah. Now, this is Sergeant Gordon Ellis again, and he says this. We were again struck. This time the shell came in through the armour into the boys' mess deck. That's the shell you've just told us about, uh, Mr. Walwyn. On the starboard side, just overhead, a little forehead of where we were. There was a loud crash as it exploded, and mess tables and forms seemed to be being thrown about all over the place, judging from the noise and clatter. Now, they are suffering casualties, and at least one is, is taken down, isn't he, to the, the, the dressing station. And, and Ellis says this, This shell resulted in our first casualty forward. Portions of it struck a stro stoker. I said stroker there, didn't I? Stoker. <laughs> Frederick Plater, or Platter, Plater, one T, by name, in the left side of the neck, causing a small perforating wound through the pharynx, from which there was a considerable, uh, at first, a considerable frothy hemorrhage. He was he was very collapsed from shock, also when brought down, but, but the bleeding was stopped by packing the wound with thin strips of gauze, and he subsequently did well. So he's doing his job, is Ellis. Now, Walwyn's doing his job, isn't he? Now, his job is organising a damage control parties, and it, speed is really important. You mustn't let things like fires start, must you? Things like that. So he says this. Called number two fire brigade, and they ran up from the flat below, and we got hoses on and put out a lot of burning refuse. Directly water went through this glow, it vanished, and I can't say what was burning. Personally, I think it was water gas or something like it. Several of the fire brigade were sick due to the sweet, sickly stench, but there was no signs of poison gas. The shell hole was clean and about the size of a scuttle. Big flakes of armour had been flung right across the mess deck, wrecking everything. Many armour bolts came away. The flooding cabinet was completely wrecked and all voice pipes and electric leads overhead were cut to pieces. Smoke was pouring up through holes in the deck and it occurred to me that the high angle magazine was very near. Told uh -huh. Pring... Sorry. <laughs> now it's me going... <laughs> <laughs> Told Pring to disconnect all flooding gear from main deck and stand by to flood from middle deck position. Water from the cut fire mains was pouring below. Now, when you get those fire mains, they're like mains in the street, and thousands of gallons of, of water flood 
the decks below X turret. And this is this is awful for one poor trap sailor. And this is uh, Able Seaman Gunner uh, Percival Cox. And he says this. The working chamber was flooded. A shell had severed the four-inch fire main and water was pouring into the handling room. I reported this to the gun house. They soon had it under control. But the sentry who was in charge of the escape hatch was drowned. That must have been a horrible death. Uh, now, Wallen... This is you, Gary. He's pausing to catch his breath. He's he's fair buggered by this, all this work and, and, and tension and stress. What, what does he say? Had a cigarette on the port side of the cook's lobby, or rather started one to steady my feelings. Had a yarn with the pay who was wondering, uh, sorry, who was wandering about in a K-Pok waistcoat using appalling language as to when the Grand Fleet were going to turn up. Had a laugh together anyway. Whilst there, a 12-inch came into warrant officer's galley and blew through the deck. A stoker alongside me looked and said, There goes my blank, 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 blank dinner. What could that word be? Blooming. <laughs> Blooming. <laughs> Royal Navy, 1916. Blooming. Uh, pay, I think, would be the paymaster. I'm yeah. not entirely certain. No, I'm pretty certain it would be, but that's what he says. Now, there's a lot, there, all this, there's kerfuffle, there's hits, alarms, there, everything. Uh, but this run to the north, they, they survive almost unscathed. I mean, they're doing well. They're, and they, they've scored repeated hits on the German ships, that, yeah, but, and they're not being sunk. Uh, now, um, meanwhile, the Grand Fleet's thundering down from Scapa Flow. They're going across, they're desperate to reach the scene of the action. They're in six columns, uh, f four ships each column, and they've got their cruiser, destroyer screens, the third battle squadron, their battle cruiser squadron, they're all there. Uh, there's also the first cruiser squadron of the rear admiral, Sir Robert Arbuthnot, who's on aboard the, the defence, not for much longer. Um, and they run straight into the German fleet, the first cruiser squadron, Arbuthnot, and uh, the defence is blown up, with all hands, um, and the warrior was left crippled. Uh, the Duke of Edinburgh, which uh, which is an uh, uh, interesting thing, um, escaped, but the warrior was absolutely crippled, and it was limping back towards the British lines. And then something absolutely amazing happens, as as because uh, this is all happening, but and this 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 is called windy corner. So the Grand Fleet's deployed onto the port column into line across the German line. Uh, the battle cruisers are racing to get in front, and the fifth battle squadron is going to tag on at the back of the battle line. And all this is happening. And what does the war spite do? And how does that that benefit the warrior tell me gary tell me what happens well it, it's without warning the war spite seems to veer out of the line and heads directly for the germans ah! she uh, she began executing a huge circle that took her dangerously near to the german line but to the intense relief of the beleaguered crew of the warrior she acted as a magnet attracting german shell fire because she's a really tempting target well of course she is it's a you know instead of a crippled stupid old uh, old cruiser this is a super dreadnought they can blow to bits if they can and she so seems does... intent on getting to as close to them as possible <laughs> Well, this is why people start to think the war spot has a character of its own. Now, this is uh, <laughs> Commander Humphrey Walwyn, and he describes what's going on. Why? Why are they turning in a stupid circle? The steering gear episode was rather extraordinary. The hit by the port wing engine room had buckled the after bulkhead of the centre engine room on which the steering engine is secured. This gave it a hot bearing, and it was labouring heavily. When turning to port to deploy astern of the Grand Fleet, we were very close to inside the Valiant. The captain did not think we could turn safely and gave the order, Port 20, to swing under the Valiant's stern. The quartermaster got a bit rattled and forced the wheel too quick, which overrode the telemotor gear due to the engine lagging with a hot bearing. Having got a swing on, the order was given, Starboard 20 degrees! and they could not get more than five degrees on. The ship was therefore 10 degrees port helm on and completed the circle twice, turning through 32 points towards the enemy's fleet. Now that is, you know, to any naval type, that is of course a perfectly sound and reasonable explanation. What I took from it that was that there was an entire, you know, it all went wrong. Yeah, and I've got this image in my head. It's almost like going round a roundabout several times. 
And, uh, I just, uh, I just love it. Uh, I didn't understand a lot of what went wrong, but that, that for those who you understand things and what a telemotor gear is and all the rest of it, that's that's that you've just explained it perfectly for them. Now, who's shooting at? Well, there's the Friedrich de Grosser, the Koenig, the Helgoland, Ostfriesland, the Thuringen, the Nassau, and the Oldenburg. All big, solid. Fairly modern German uh, uh, pre dreadnoughts, not pre dreadnoughts, dreadnoughts. They're all blasting away at various times uh, with their main and secondary. It's within range, Gary. The secondary armor, the the uh, the, the five point nine or whatever the secondary armor is, uh, this, uh, and they're at varying ranges from nine and a half thousand to thirteen thousand five hundred yards. This is close range for these guns. Uh, and watching them is a chap called, oh, he's rather posh, Lieutenant Anthony de Salis. And he's on HMS Moresby, the part of 13th uh, dis, uh, destroyer flotilla. What does uh, de Salis say? War spite was being continually straddled, and I remember seeing the greater part of the salvo land upon her. She appeared to do something that can be best described as bounce under it. The whole ship seemed to move or give to port under it momentarily, and she rolled a little but seemed to recover and went on firing immediately afterwards. I remember thinking what magnificent ships they were. Now, what I want to... Uh, the, the thing is, we've we've talked about this before. When something goes wrong on a ship, it often goes wrong quickly. You're either all right or you're dead. And at this point, what is saving the men of the war spite? Is it bad German gunnery? Is it luck? What is it that's saving them? Well, in essence, it's the war spite. You know, because they're firing at the war spike, that gives time, I presume, uh, for the uh, the crew of the warrior to, to be evacuated. No, no, we're talking about the war spike. It's the 13 inches of armour on the war spike, oh, which is I protecting forgive. it. Forgive me, I was talking <laughs> about the warrior. The warrior, the, well, the, you're absolutely right. The warrior, the, as we've said before, is, is protected. The war spike is protected by the, her armour. It's not luck, it's not bad German gunnery. It's her armour. 13 um, inches. 13 inches, indeed. 13 inches of solid steel. Um, in fact, it's, uh, isn't that reinforced? That but she's, super still, strong she's steel. still under the cosh, Pete, even with 13 oh, inches yeah. of armour. She's getting, she's getting battered. Hammered. Yeah, uh, you normally say batter to buggery, I believe. Now, this is Assistant Clerk Gilbert uh, Bickmore uh, on the war spot. He says, only the fact that the ship was continuing to turn in circles like a kitten chasing its own tail saved us from being sunk. So he disagrees entirely with me and I disagree entirely with him. <laughs> The noise of shells hitting or bursting close alongside sounded like rapid independent fire from our battery of six-inch guns. The ship was heavily hit. Now, that is something we all agree on. He's saying the ship is being heavily hit. 13-inch yeah, so armour or not, it's still getting yeah. hit. That's what I mean. It, the 13-inch armour is what's protecting it, isn't it? Yeah. That's what's saving it. Uh, so well, he's an idiot. Well, in circles. Uh, I think the, the German gunners can uh, allow for that. Um, now, Walwyn's got his work cut out. He, he's organising these damage control parts. And one of the really dangerous things is a shell goes through into this starboard six-inch gun battery casement and causes us... Now, this is like almost like a gun deck on the... Uh, on the uh, victory, remember when we went to the victory or the warrior? It's almost, it's quite open, and there's a severe cordite fire, and there's midshipmen setting up fire hoses to, to dampen it down, and then they try and rescue the uh, survivors. And this is midshipman John Bostock. He says this: there was a great deal of noise going on in Number Six Casement. We knew that the gun crew must be burnt pretty badly, and this did not make it a pleasant job spraying cold water into the casement. But still, it had to be done because if the rest of the cordite had caught fire. There's no knowing what might have happened. We played the hose and the fire till no actual flames could be seen. I went to the breakwater of the uh, breakwater of the casement. The after end of, the, of it was in absolute darkness, except for one solitary electric light, which looked dull red. The air was thick with smoke, so I donned my trusty respirator and went to see if I could rescue any of the gun's crew. I saw one dilapidated looking figure stagger forward and lean against the breakwater. I found it was gun layer petty officer Yeo. Yeo? Yeo? Yeo. Y-E-O. He was quite calm and told me he was burnt all over, could not touch anything with his hands. So I helped him over the breakwater, which was almost too hot to touch, and supported him into the other battery. I found he could walk all right, as long, so long as I held him up. Poor sod. Uh, and Burns, of course, 
You might be all right then, but you often die from the after effects. Uh, now, another shell smashes home and, and, and Humphrey Walwyn rushes to the scene. And this is you again, uh, Gary. I went below again and found a second shell had come through into the boys' mess deck, through the embrasure overhead. Smoke was pouring out of wet provision room and seeing Pring leaning up against bulkhead told him to flood it. He seemed dazed and silly and I bit him for not getting on quicker. I didn't know at the time that he was very badly hit. Anyway, he did the job before he was too far gone. Looked through the hole in the armour on the boy's mess stick. It looked red, lurid and beastly. Heavy firing all around and splashes everywhere, though we were steaming slow. Now, that, that's a, I just imagine this poor son, he's lying there almost dying and you shout at him, Gary. Yeah. Get on with it. Still, still, he did his job. Did Very his brave job. man, Pring. Uh, now, two decks below them is the transmitting station. Remember where we, where the young midshipmen are on the plotting table? And they're, they're terrified by uh, uh, the after effects of, of, a shell, of this shell. And it seemed it's out of all proportion because they, they don't know what's happening and their imagination sort of runs away with them. This is a midshipman, William Fell. He says this. Then came an appalling crash. We were all knocked off our stools and probably slightly dazed. My first recollection was that I was sitting in a pool of water in almost complete darkness. All noise had ceased. I remember being speechless and very, very scared. Uh, oh, but stood up and saw streaks of water shooting into the transmitting function through the voice pipes. That all the instruments had ceased to fun function and their engines were stopped. I could only think of the three armoured hatches that were shot above us. Now, he doesn't know, Gary, whether the ship's sinking or not. And I want you to think of being on the Queen Mary or the Indefatigable or the Invincible, the ships that did sink. And that's exactly the same thing. You're down below and water starts to come through the voice pipes. And you think, are we sinking? You don't know. And in those cases, they were. Well, in this case, they're not. Anyway, the damage, it's building up, isn't it? Back to Humphrey Walwyn. What are you up to? Decks were all warped and resin under uh, cortisine crackling like burning holly. The upper deck and superstructure looked perfectly awful, holed everywhere. I think at this time the firing had slackened, but the noise was deafening. Shells bursting short through tons of water over the ship. The fore structure itself was in an awful state of chaos. Port shelter completely gone and starboard side had several big holes in it. Everything wrecked and looked like a burnt out factory, all blackened and beams twisted everywhere. Now, uh, eventually, uh, Captain Edward Philpott, we haven't had much from him, but <laughs> in fact, we haven't had anything other than that. But he managed to regain control of the ship. It stopped circling. It only goes around twice, but it must have seemed awful. And the sort of ordeal comes to a bit of an end. As we said, the thick armour has kept out the German shells. And, and the circling. The, and the circling. I'm, I'm going to give you the circling. Do you not think it was the circling that put them in danger? It might have done, yes. Anyway, this is Sergeant Gordon Ellis, and he says this. Our ca and this is a tribute to the War Spikes armour, in a sense. After all those shells, our casualties were completely comparatively slight. The worst cases we had were sent down to us forward, sent down to us forward, were a burns due to a cordite fire breaking out in the starboard battery. That's the ones we heard about earlier. Eleven cases, including Father Pollen, the Roman Catholic chaplain, were brought down suffering from very severe and extensive burns of the face, body and limbs. They were so badly burnt that one could do very little to relieve them of the pain and shock. Injections of morphia seemed to have very little if any effect on them. As regards dressing, the, the specially applied uh, picric acid lint was at first applied, but they could not be kept on owing to the pain, causing the, the patients to tear their batteries, their batteries, their bandages off, and they, they were accordingly dressed afterwards with either boracic ointment or oil. This proved more successful, but the restlessness of the patients all the time they were abroad aboard the ship made it very difficult matter to keep them protected by dressings. One couldn't keep them still, even with repeated hypodermic injections of morphia. Sepsis can't be can't be helped because the burns are bound to get septic in any case and one's chief treatment is directed towards alleviating the pain and severity of the shock to the patient as much as possible. Uh, it that's, must have been that's awful. That's terrible. 
That is awful. It, I, I just feel so sorry for those poor chaps. Um, now, the chat, as the, as the war spites emerging from its circles, what do you think the uh, captain has in mind? Well, he's only got one thing in mind at first, and this is, uh, this is, for, uh, this is uh, you, C- Commander Humphrey at Walwyn, who gets, his, uh, he gets, he gets told by the captain what's, what's to happen. I got a message from the captain that he wanted me at once. I was by this time as black as a sweet and wet through, but quite untouched. The captain asked me how things were, and I started to tell him. He said, I don't care a damn about the damage. Can we join the line? I hadn't the faintest idea what the situation was or what had happened. and must have seemed a bit queer. Anyway, I said, if she gets another heavy hit on the port side, I don't think she'll stand it. Now, this whole incident of the circuit had lasted about 10 minutes. Uh, they, they found they could do about 16 knots. Uh, but by this time, they were a bit separate. Obviously, if they're circling round, the, the rest of the squadrons chasing after the Grand Fleet, uh, you well, know, they've moving completed round. the deployment that they were doing originally. Uh, that's they? right. So they'd have sailed on, yeah. And they'd gone on. So now Phil Potts, wireless assistant, says, where are you? We'll join you. And he's ordered back to Rosyth. Um uh, stop messing about. Go you to go back to harbour with all possible speed. Uh, well, that's about sixty knots at the start. Um, now, what's the problem? Uh, uh, it's a long way to Rosyth, isn't it? Yeah, and she's got no escort at all, and uh, <laughs> most of her lifeboats have have been holed. So, if there is a problem, she's not in any position to to save the the, the crew, and she's course, she's in effect limping. Because the lifeboats, of course, are on the superstructure, which have been hit by all these shells. Now, the armour may keep it out from the vitals, but it doesn't protect the lifeboats. Of course it doesn't. Now, uh, you're going to be uh, John Hazelwood. Not sure of his rank, never known his rank. Uh, he's on war spite, though, and what, he, what does he say? When I got out, I was amazed at what I saw. <clears throat> Part of the bridge was, all, uh, was alight. A store of lifeboats under the bridge were in flames. I could see there was a fire raging in a six-inch battery where the cordite was alight. The upper deck was riddled with shell. The funnels were holed. Every boat in the ship had a hole in it, and the ship looked really bad. Now, uh, Gordon Ellis, he pops out on deck, the surgeon, Gordon Ellis, pops out on deck to see what's happening, you know, in between treating the patients. Uh, And he was stunned, (laughs) because last time he'd seen the ship, if you think about it, it was pristine and all lovely. And now uh, now it's shocked, but he sort of gets his confidence back quickly. He says this. Only a few hours before, she'd been one of the cleanest and smartest looking ships in the fleet. Her deck spotlessly white and her light grey paint freshly put on, only recently gleaming everywhere in the sunshine. Now her decks were filthy, littered with debris and in places torn up by shells. One of the quarter deck ladders had been blown away. Her funnels had ragged holes in them. The small iron ladder on X turret had been bent, twisted and broken away from its lower supports, while the side of the turrets were covered in with marks from glass hits. The damage, fortunately, was on the whole more spectacular than real. She was afloat and, barring bad weather, perfectly seaworthy. So he sort of cheers up a bit. Uh, now, uh, it's. Uh, I wonder what how the. I wonder how the day's going for Commander Humphrey Walwyn. What do you think? Uh, well, next day, first of June's but, a, a, another busy day for him, and uh, it's with some trepidation that he tackles the job of collecting the dead from uh, below the decks, Pete. And this is what he says. Went aft and tried to square up hole by port casement lobby. Got half a dozen men to get the dead out of the flat below. I was afraid of myself that I should get cold feet at seeing dead men. But one was so hardened that I didn't care a rap. They were badly knocked about, but absolutely dry and not bleeding at all. Hmm. Mm. That's uh, quite chastening again. Now, uh, they're on their way back. So the, 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 the battle, remember, is occurring on the 31st and they're making their way back on the 1st. That's where, where we are now. Uh, the rest of the battle, just listen to our other podcast uh, to find uh, what, what's happening to the rest of it. But the, they're, they're the war spite's on its way back to Rosyth. Now, the tr- there's a problem with this. What does the Ger- what do the Germans know? Why 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 are they still at risk? What's well, going on? The Gary? Germans will know in the event that there's any damaged shipping heading back that they're going to go back to their bases. So they know the routes. So I should think that uh, the the British were particularly concerned that there may well be submarines on the route. 
and or indeed Eubanks, Shear has, as they were then called, of course. Oh, uh, both, 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 Gary. Uh, the, so Shear had actually ordered his U-boats to to, to intercept. Um, and uh, C- Commander Humphrey Walwyn says this uh, because uh, uh, th- this is where Warspite began to get a reputation as a lucky ship. What what does he say now? About seven a.m., the captain sent for me and said he was certain we should be attacked by submarines and to do all I could to get everything as ready as possible. So I got up a deck six inch cruise closed up and went on getting rafts, etc. built. Had a strong party plugging holes up in cabins and quarter deck aft and used up all the blankets and bedding from after cabins. The captain's cabin was about a foot deep in water. I did not even then know that the capstan engine flat had been holed beneath the water line and got the five ton pump underway trying to pump it out. They plugged away all the forenoon but made no impression. This was natural as they were pumping the North Sea out <laughs> and back to itself again. My fault entirely, but these things look foolish afterwards. I love that. They're pumping away, the water's going straight out, going back in. Hooray! Now, uh, they do run into a concentration of submarines off the east coast of Scotland. And uh, she's very lucky. This is Sub Lieutenant Assistant Clark uh, Gilbert uh, Bickmore again. He says this A German submarine fired two torpedoes at us. She had misjudged our speed and zigzag and had come up to attack right astern. So she only had our stern to aim at. She made a very good shot. The, t- the two torpedoes running up. One on each side of our quarter deck. I stood on the quarter deck, <laughs> blind my <laughs> and watched the one on the starboard side. It began to turn towards the ship and looked as if it was going to hit, but at the last moment it reached the end of its run and sank. I breathed again. So very close to being hit, but the, basically the submarine's in the wrong place. You're not meant to aim from behind. You're meant to aim from in front, uh, from uh, uh, from the side, aren't you? The classic view. Now down uh, below. That- Ellis is writing. He's busy writing up his case notes, ready for transferring the wounded to hospital when they get into port. And he becomes aware that all was not well. And you're going to read what he says. Yeah, this is Gordon Ellis again, Surgeon Gordon Ellis. He says, Williamson, Williamson suddenly pushed aside the curtain and informed us that a torpedo just passed along the ship's side, only about some 10 feet off. This was a new complication and had the effect of making me feel I wanted to go up on deck at once. For what reason, I didn't know. <laughs> but the PMO went on writing with his usual imp- imperturbability. Oh, I can't say that. Imperturbability. <laughs> God. So that for fe- sheer shame, I felt bound to stay also. However, the job was nearly finished and I did not waste any time then in going up on the forecastle deck where I found a number of other officers assembled. It had come from astern and as we watched the periscope on top of the conning tower of the submarine from which it been, had been dispatched emerged above the surface about half a mile distant on the port quarter. The guns crew of the port six inch on the forecastle deck immediately fired in its direction and the shell pitched sufficiently close for the spray to hide all sight of it. It probably was not hit, but at any rate, when the spray had subsided, it was no longer visible. Now, this is lucky because it's not a coordinated attack, is it? It, it? It's not. But they're desperately short of destroyers. They've got no destroyers with them to protect them. And and uh, Sergeant Gordon Ellis says this then, uh, same chap. We had, we had made urgent signals for a destroyer escort to be sent, and what, one could only hope that they, they would speedily turn up. About an hour later, just after lunch, they did, six of them, and one felt comparatively safe again then. The chances of us seeing the fourth bridge again had, up until then, been a a question of some doubt in my mind. I bet it was. Now, uh... Well, this is one sign of how great the, they are, the, these ships, because even after all this, by this time, after the repairs that Walwyn's been doing the rest of it, they've managed to get up to some 21 knots. They may be exaggerated slightly, but it's, it's only... Th- they really are super, super dreadnoughts, aren't they? They're great. Now, they're they get super. back to the... They're super. They're super. super. At first uh, afternoon of 1st of June, they reached a further forth, and, and, and it's the first ship back into Rosyth after the battle. And Assistant Clarks, Gilbert Bickmore, says this. We passed under the... Remember, they went out just two days before. We passed under the fourth bridge at about three o'clock, still on fire with our funnels belching smoke from their many perforations. We were greeted by loud cheers from the men at work on the bridge as we passed under it. The nurses on the hospital ships, the the naval hospital ships, and they know they're going to have work to do. And you're going to be nursing sister Mary Clark of the hospital city, hospital city, hospital ship, Plassey. 
We were all up on deck after dinner, watching and waiting, when we saw through the mist and rain two destroyers come under the fourth bridge, and following them very slowly, but still in a stately manner, the first battle-scarred heroine, HMS War Spite. Now, I want to, what do you think about this? Think of what's happened to the War Spite. All that fire it had been under, and 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 if if it had sunk, there'd have been a thousand more, a thousand twelve hundred dead. What were the casualties, Gary? What were the casualties? For, and you, 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 I mean, obviously they're painful, but what were they? Well, remarkably, it was fourteen killed and thirty-two wounded. And that you see, if a ship survives, and the armor keeps the shells out or away. Uh, of course, it's still painful. It is still painful. And you're going to be engine room artificer first class. Thomas, you've not been first class often in life, have you? Uh, Thomas Collins. What do, what, do you, what do you say, Thomas Collins? A stretcher was being carried past with a body completely swathed in bandages with only holes for mouth, nose and eyes. As the stretcher passed, we heard a voice saying, God bless war spite and recognised it as that of Father Poland, who was badly burned trying to save men in a six-inch battery deck when the cordite ammunition was set on fire. Carey broke down and wept like a child. So, does it matter how many, in one sense, the, the casualties are still painful, still cause emotional trauma? And, uh, uh, I mean, Poland's a very brave man. Um, now, uh, the, the Queen Elizabeth has moved out of dock, uh, where she'd been doing having having her bottom scraped, and uh, the war spites moved in there. Um, so, what does that mean about the fighting strength of the Grand Fleet, and well, how does this typify what's happening? Yeah, I mean, this this is going to be typical, and this probably it, you know it, could, it must be very demoralising if you are the German fleet, because basically, the the fighting strength of the Grand Fleet is completely unaffected because it's so, a one for one swap. So you may have damaged the war spy. In fact, the Germans claimed to have sunk her. Uh, they were wrong. Uh, but uh, but in actual fact, yeah, there is a, a exactly similar ship to replace her. Fighting strength, as you say, exactly the same. Now, um, we're getting near the end now, because um, Sister Jutland, we, we're not looking at the Battle of Jutland, we're looking at the war spy. Why do you think the, 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 the war spy became so famous after this? Why? Well, it's... <laughs> It, you know, I think you would call it the eccentric nature of the the double circle. I've just got this vision in my head of the game it round mad, and round it? in It's circles, just mad, isn't it? Uh, under the collective noses of the high seas fleet, it's almost like she's snubbing them, isn't it? And uh, the effectiveness, as you rightly said, of her armour, which shielded her crew. And let's not forget, Pete, the sheer military power she exudes. Um, you know, it gives it gives the war spite an added cachet that was wow. <laughs> that was from that day on to mark her out for the rest of her her long naval career, and she did have a very long and distinguished naval career. It was the first of many fascinating battles she was in. Uh, the, uh, it, I mean, she was back in the line within months, uh, and and people always have an attachment to their old, their old ship. It doesn't matter what the ship is, whether it's a tugboat, a submarine, or or, or a really crappy old. Dread uh, pre dreadnought, but the war spite people were really fond of it had saved their lives. All the men on that ship owed their lives to that ship, and it, and it's and as mentioned, ability. they considered her to be a lucky ship. You know, people wanted to serve on her. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure it's lucky in the sense that <laughs> her engine, her steering mechanism broke down. That's lucky. No, but it's lucky in <laughs> but, the sense but that... But she got away with it, yeah. Yeah, she gets away with it. And as you rightly said, had she sunk, we would have been talking of numbers in the many hundreds. Very, well, uh, definitely. Well, there's, uh, there's about, what, 11, 1,200 men on her. So, and very few would have got off her if she'd blown up or sunk in a, in a gigantic explosion. Well, that's it for today. Uh, that's uh, HMS War Spite. We will be looking at the HMS War Spite in the Second World War. But uh, today, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna say, uh, hope you've been enjoying our Chattanatta. That's our other po podcast stream, which which uh, should have started by now. Uh, and to say thank you, Gary, for being lovely as ever. And I'd like to say thank you, Peter, for correcting me when I was trying to make a point about Warrior. But yes, that's very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, Pete.